Hello there. I'm Mary Myatt and I'm just pulling together uh, 10 elements, 10 things we might want to think about um, as we're having conversations about the curriculum. I hope you find these helpful. So the first is um, that we need to be thinking about the extent to which our curriculum thinking is underpinned by ambition. Now it's helpful to think uh, in relation to this and to remind ourselves um, that we do enjoy doing things that are difficult, uh, both adults and children, that we are in fact a challenge seeking species. Um, as long as the conditions that we're working in, uh, whether in classrooms or in schools, generally uh, are characterised by high challenge and low threat. That's when we do um, our best work. The second is to think about, um, related to this, is the extent to which we're then planning for challenge uh, for all our pupils, regardless of their starting points. So when we talk to children um, about their thinking on um, the kind of work that they're offered, um, their responses quite often are saying that they would like more demanding work, please. So I think we've got a fair wind behind us in order to be able to say, well, let's make sure that whatever we're offering our children really does stretch them. The third area linked to the first two is to make sure that we don't have a diminished diet for some of our pupils, particularly some of those who might need additional support. Um, there's a lot of work that shows that all children enjoy doing difficult, demanding things as long as they have appropriate scaffolding and support. So what we've got here um, is an example from um, some pupils that were being interviewed as they went from year five into year six from Alison Peacock's book, um, Assessment for Learning Without Limits, which came out in 2015. Um, now, although the children are being asked about what they think of ability tables um, in, in um, primary schools, their answers are talking about the kind of work they're getting. And so this is why I'm uh, about to share it. So the first day the children were back, we asked them what they thought of ability groups. The answers were astounding. The more able loved it. They enjoyed being the bright ones and having special challenges set by the teacher. The middle group were annoyed that they didn't get the same work and challenges as the other group. They wanted to try harder work, but they'd worked out they'd never be moved up as there were only six seats on the top table. The less able were affected the most. They felt dumb, useless. They thought they'd never be allowed challenges as they usually work with a teaching assistant. And this less able group liked the sound of some of the challenges the top group had, but they knew they would never get the chance. So I think the main message we can take from this, regardless of um, ability grouping, which is a separate topic, is that this and other work is indicating that children enjoy and relish um, being offered material which is above their pay grade as long as they have appropriate support. And it's this notion of ambition for all our pupils, regardless of their starting points, which is um, a thread in the inspection framework. So the fourth area we might want to consider is the importance of concepts. So again, we've got these appearing in the framework, um, actually for very good reasons. There's um, a great deal of evidence um, from cognitive science um, that um, concepts, when we teach them, when we find them, um, they help to make learning deeper. So they're really helpful for us in our planning when we identify the concepts and the big ideas because they act as holding baskets. Um, they make rich connections um, between the bits of information that link to the concept or the big ideas um, or the big idea and across to other concepts as well. So they're incredibly powerful. Um, now, what's helpful in relation to thinking about concepts is um, that there are plenty of them, but there aren't too many. And so we might want to be thinking about the extent to which we're pulling out um, the ones that have got most power in terms of deepening learning for our children. Because once they're taught a concept, once they've really got to grips with it, it then means that new information that relates to that concept um, becomes very sticky. 
The fifth element, which I think it's useful to bear in mind when we're having conversations about the curriculum, um, is the power of story. So Dan Willingham's work and others um, have shown that when we include stories as part of our planning, um, as part of the inclusion um, of in either introducing uh, new aspects of um, our units um, on a regular basis, that the learning is likely to be deeper. So this is incredibly powerful, incredibly useful, and I think it needs to be taken seriously. So at the heart of what's going on here is the ideas that our brains privilege story, that we remember things more deeply um, and for a longer um, time over the longer term um, if we've encountered them within a story. So the great news is, is that there are stories in every part of the curriculum. It's about identifying and including those um, in our plans if we want to secure deeper learning. So stories matter because they create the big picture and one of the things that we need to be thinking about as we're um, going about our curriculum thinking and planning is we want to make sure that children have background or as um, Christine Council calls it, the hinterland, the sense of where this unit, what we're currently learning, um, sits within um, a bigger picture or bigger story. So um, telling stories to children um, at all key stages is a very efficient way of doing this. Um, stories and texts also generally contain complex ideas. So again, a very efficient way of um, getting um, the, some big stuff over to our pupils and students. Um, now the vocabulary um, in written text is generally uh, more complex, more sophisticated, um, contains tier two and tier three um, vocabulary. Um, unlike our daily talk in classrooms, which is far more around tier one vocabulary, much more day to day language. Uh, that's not a problem. But if we want to um, really extend our pupils thinking, um, their talk and their writing, then we need to be uh, making sure that they have access to this. And so one of the most efficient ways of doing it is that um, is through story and high quality texts. Um, and then the final reason that stories matter is because they are inclusive. Um, generally find that a high quality text has multiple entry points and um, can be um, access, accessed um, for all students, regardless of their starting points, um, as long as they're given some support to get in there. Plenty of research that shows that. So the sixth element that I think it's um, worth uh, bearing in mind um, is the power of talk. Um, so as the great James Britton said in 1970, writing floats on a sea of talk. Um, and I think if we want to make sure that our um, curriculum thinking and planning and implementation is really powered up, we need to pay far more attention to the quality of talk in classrooms. Um, just to take one example, if you look at the English national curriculum, um, there are four elements uh, to English, whether we're considering the primary or the secondary one, um, and writing is number four. Um, writing needs to be fed by speaking, by listening, and by reading. And so this applies too, I believe, to other subjects as well, that if we want to get high quality um, written work from our pupils and students, the first three need really serious attention. Speaking, listening and reading is going to feed the quality of their writing. The seventh element um, is uh, just to share with you um, a piece of uh, draft planning, which I have done um, and which is available on my website, where I have worked up a unit in religious education, because that's my background, um, underpinned um, by story, by concepts and by talk. And so just to let you know that that is, um, if you would like to see a short video on that, it's on um under the resources, the downloadable resources. There's a link to that so you can see the thinking through building these elements into um, a unit of work.
just in a bit more detail. Um, and so there we've got it on. Uh, that's what you'll be. That's what you'll be downloading. OK, so the eighth element um, is having a think about marking and feedback. Um, I'm afraid I'm still getting um, emails and um, people messaging me to say, should I be marking every piece of work? And the answer is obviously no. Uh, we need to be really crystal clear um, if we're going to have the chance to do really deep work on curriculum thinking. Um, we need to be taking far more efficient ways of uh, marking. We should really be thinking about feedback. And lots of schools now are working on whole class feedback sheets. Um, this isn't just a way of saving time. Um, it's also what we're finding is that um, pupils and students um, are making greater gains in their learning. This is evident not just from what teachers are saying, but pupils and students are saying it themselves that the feedback they're getting when we move over to whole class feedback um, is much more efficient, saves time, powers the learning on much sooner on the next lesson. Um, and is important in relation to the curriculum that we cannot waste time um, on things which are not adding value to children's learning. And so um, if we want to get some of the big stuff, finding the big stories, the big concepts, we've got to start thinking very hard about what we're going to cut back on. And uh, mocking is uh, pretty high on the hit list for that. Um, <clears throat> The ninth area that I think it's worth considering um, is how we think um, about data, about how we're gathering evidence for thinking about the curriculum. Um, one of the problems is um, that progress is not linear. Um, any authentic learning is going to have blips in it. You've only got to think of Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve. Um, and yet we um, are somehow wedded to the idea or large parts of the sector are that we need to have um, these graphs that um, take a trajectory in a smooth line. Um, it's much more subtle and uh, more nuanced than that. Um, so we need to get away from the idea that um, we've got to have all these numbers. Basically, we've got a data deluge within the system um, and we've also got a data drought. We're not using the numbers um, properly, uh, that's probably because they're not uh, telling us anything uh, meaningful. So we now need to be moving on to Christine Council's um, great uh, dictum, which she um, developed with Michael Fordham, um, which makes so much sense, is that actually it's the teaching of the curriculum that is the progression model. Um, the extent to which my pupils or students have learnt what I have taught them um, is an indicator of their progress. It's not the numbers which we know are neither valid nor reliable. So uh, when we're thinking about impact in relation to the curriculum, how do we know whether our pupils have learnt um, what we've taught them? Well, we have a look at their work. Notice I refer to work, um, not written, uh, not their writing because writing is part of work, but there could be other things that they have produced, which are indicators and give us insights into whether our pupils have learned what we've taught them. Um, and I think it's worth reminding ourselves that pupils' work is often, um, or not often, it is actually a bigger agenda than just what they have written down on a piece of paper. Um, so it could be the questions um, that they respond to, low stakes quizzes, um, their verbal responses in class. All this is included in their work. Um, Tim Oates, who led on the review of the national curriculum, is very good on this. He talks about children's products that give us insights into what they have learned. Um, I'm also going to know um, whether they have learned what I've taught them uh, through what they say. And interestingly, we know from what's happening on inspection. These are the primary um, routes through which um, conversations are being had to have some uh, come to some conclusions about the quality of what's being offered to children, looking at their work and talking to them. Um, and I think there's a further element. Um, can we observe something um, that, that they can do on their own terms? Um, as a result of what we've taught them. Um, and this is judgments that we will make as professionals 
Um, we do not need to be producing um, hundreds of different photographs to evidence what children have done. We use a bit of evidence uh, to tell a big story, but we also come to professional judgments. Um, and I think here it's worth saying that um, the work being done by um, Daisy Christodoulou and Chris Wheaton on comparative judgment taps into this notion that we recognise good work when we see it. Um, and so to move away from a very complicated um, criteria, which um, can quite often mask underperformance and can make children's work quite artificial. So to have more nuanced ways about how we make judgments about the quality um, of what we've offered our children and whether they have actually learned it or not. And then the 10th element is um, to remind ourselves that as we go about this work, that we're human beings first, we're professionals second, that the young people we work with, they're human beings first and their learners second, that we can only really do this work day by day. So we keep the momentum going, but we need to make sure that we don't wear ourselves out, that we enjoy this work. Um, and we're likely then to impart our enjoyment to our pupils and students. Um, if you'd like to find out more about my resources, they're there on merrymark.com. Um, I hope you found that helpful.